Got it. Amen. Turn to the book of Genesis. First book in the Bible. Chapter 11. This message in, in its forms, uh, Sunday school's business for the ones that just came in. Um, this message in its forms and iterations has been coming to me over the last couple of weeks. And it's really a message of not earning God's grace, not being able to earn God's grace. It's an inability for us to expect payment from God. Right? There's, there's no way for us to get paid by God for what we do. Okay? So the story that's going to illustrate this today is really trying to get to God in our own power. Trying to use our own might, our own power to access God. So Genesis chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Many of you, most of you, hopefully all of you, already are familiar with this story. The Tower of Babel. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing they purpose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because the Lord confused their language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. We get to God not in our own greatness, but by His greatness. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You. We praise You for Your Word, Lord Jesus. I ask You to touch me, anoint me for any word that You've given, Lord. I, I have nothing in myself to give the people. I have nothing that's going to bring about Your Holy Spirit working, that's going to edify, that's going to convict, that's going to do the work that You need done in this place. In the hearts of the people, Lord. We all have work that needs to be done in our hearts, Lord Jesus. And I can't do it. So I ask, humbly, for your precious Holy Spirit to be present. Anoint me. Touch every word that I say, Lord. Withheld any word from my mouth that is not profitable, Lord. And Lord, anoint everyone here, myself included, to understand what it is that you're trying to say to us, Lord. Let this not be a dead sermon, Lord, but let this be a message from you, directly from your throne, out of your word, Lord Jesus. For now, for our hearts, Lord, we thank you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So the background of the Tower of Babel, obviously, you have the flood immediately preceding it. Noah and the flood. Right? And why was the earth initially flooded? Simple, to destroy mankind. Genesis 6 and 5, the intent of their thoughts, of their heart, was only evil continually. Sounds like today. Mm -hmm. Man had got to such a point of depravity and such a point where they were rebelling against God that Noah and seven of his family members were the only righteous people on earth. And by righteous, here's how you got to think of righteous. People who are seeking God. David was called a man after God's own heart. If I could be remembered as a man after God's own heart, I'll take it. That's it. I don't need any accomplishments. I don't need a monument. I don't need anything else. A man after God's own heart. But look at what David did in his life. Murder. Adultery. Doubted God. By uh, conducting a census of Israel. Essentially saying that his power lied in the might of the army of Israel and not in his God. But he was still viewed as a man after God's own heart. Jesus Christ was called the son of David. Clearly, that was a man who was righteous. But it wasn't because he earned it. And it wasn't because of anything that he did to try and be righteous before God. It's what he believed. It's what he trusted in. It's where his faith was. You 
His faith was in the sacrifice. His faith was in the fact that he could approach God because of the sacrifice, because of the blood of bulls and goats. Now, it didn't pay for sin at that time, but he had faith that when that animal was killed and offered up on the altar, the plan that God had instituted, the, the plan of which Jesus was the fulfillment of that type, that he could enter into God's presence. And he trusted God for everything in his life. Right. So Noah was looked at as, as one of the only righteous people on the earth, him and his, his family members. He was described in 2 Peter 2 and 5 as a preacher of righteousness. So of all accounts, he was spreading the gospel. He was trying to turn people towards God within his day. And only seven of his family members, of the millions or hundreds of millions or however many people were on the earth at the time, perished. Those were the only ones who were righteous. Now righteousness comes exclusively from God. A thought that God has been, uh, another thing God's been working on in my heart is this, this whole persona of trying to fake perfection in the church. Right? Trying to put on this face that right, we won't go through troubles and we're perfect. And, uh, you know, listen, I understand be pleasant, be nice to people, but don't fake it. And certainly don't fake perfection because I know you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. This word says you're not going to be perfect. It says you're being perfected. Right? So don't confuse the fact that a faking perfection with pressing on towards perfection. That's what Paul was doing. That high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That conformity into the image of Jesus Christ. Which we're all called to be. Every one of us as believers are to be getting better. If you're not, you're backsliding. But it's not this, this fake persona of you know, you're holier than thou. You have no problems. That's nonsense. And the world's not going to buy that. I'll tell you, they won't. So whoever you're putting that on for, nobody's buying it. And what you're de depriving the world of is being able to see Christ working in you. I, I see less, and I said this this morning, I see less of Christ in somebody who's faking, trying to be perfect, than somebody who's struggling but relying on the Lord. Because then the world says, I can rely on the Lord too. If they have this problem, which I have, or similarly, and they rely on the Lord, I can also rely on Him. He is a solid rock that I can stand on. But if you act fake and you act like you're perfect at all times, it will come across as such. And nobody will see Christ in you. So that's righteousness. Righteousness comes exclusively from God. So Noah followed God's plan, and he lived. Just like today. Right? The ark was a type of Christ. They were shut in. They were safe when they were in the ark. So like we're safe in Christ. But Noah didn't see the water. Noah wasn't even feeling any raindrops on his head. He built the ark exactly like God told him to build it. Well, shouldn't it be a, a little bit bigger? Or should I use something besides gopher wood? God, I mean, it doesn't sound like the strongest wood. But do you think maybe I should uh, make a little balcony on top so I can I can see? So, no. Here's the plan. Follow it. You live. You want to do something else? You'll get a different result. It's death. Sin. Sin leads to death. What is sin in its first form we see in the Bible? Rebellion. All sin is rebellion against God. It's rebellion against God's perfect, holy way. And when you rebel, when you try to set your own plan in place, you rebel against God in the highest order. Especially when man sets aside the cross of Christ and tries to make their own way to God. There is no higher rebellion against God and setting aside what he did at Calvary for us. When Christ shed his life's blood on our behalf to put aside for our own empty and worthless religion that we want to put forth to earn our way to God. So Noah followed God's plan and lived. All others, they died. They perished. All on this earth will perish without God's plan. The gospel is highly exclusive. <clears throat> exclusive, right? It's not exclusive in who can come, but it's an exclusive in how you can come. So it's not limited to any race, 
any ethnicity. All are equal. All are of the same race. Human. But there's only one way that those human beings can come. And that's through Christ. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Why? Because you can't get to a holy God with the stain of sin on your life. You can't. You can't enter into the presence of heaven, which is not a reward for good people, but it's a home for those who've been forgiven. Right? It's not I did more good than I did bad by my own standards, so I'm worthy of heaven. I love that. By whose standards? Your shifting scales? Your unbalanced scales that think that what you do is not as bad as what somebody else does? Oh, well, they, you know, woo, their jealousy, oh, their, their uh, gossip. Meanwhile, you're doing the same thing at that time, okay? So how can we be good judges? We're not. We're not just. You know, we will have fruits of the Spirit and justice, but perfect, unwavering justice. Look at God's justice when he sent his only son to die on our behalf, right? So this is like, man wants to make a name for himself. So this is what the Tower of Babel was all about. This is what they were trying to do. They wanted to make a name for themselves. They wanted to build it up to heaven, right? They wanted to get up to God in their own power. Religion, in its purest form, right here. To be like God. Does that sound familiar? The Garden of Eden? Satan's first lie to mankind. You'll be like God. Their eyes will be open. And you'll be like God. That's all man wants. They want to be their own God. They want to stay in control. And we as believers get saved. Have the Holy Spirit. And we still want to keep the control. Right? Even though we believe on the salvation. And we are saved if we were to die. Go on to be with the Lord. We would enter into heaven. Undoubtedly. If you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior for your sins. You will go to heaven. But we don't submit to his lordship while on this earth. We want to keep the control in our own hands. And we may not see it as such, but it is. Anything that you fully haven't handed over to him, and 100% trust and dependence, any relationship that you're not completely dependent on the Lord, any financial situation that is not completely in his hands, why do you stress? Why do you worry about money? I'm, I'm putting myself at the front of the line. I do these things too. That's the thing. I'm, I'm talking about pressing on today. I'm not talking about faking perfection. I'm talking about God's righteousness working through us because of what he did at the cross, not our own fake self-righteousness. Why do we worry about finances? Why? Didn't God say he'd provide for all our needs? And where do we go after this? Heaven. We're not going to need anything. You don't have to show up to heaven's gates with any, any luggage or anything to move in. Everything is provided. And even as a Christian, everything you need is provided. God will give it to you. Well, I don't have it today. The checkbook says this, the bank account says this, but the bill says that. Believe God. But Adam, you don't I got believe God. No, I do understand. Believe God. Because he's going to provide for every single need. If he didn't provide for it, maybe it's not a need. Okay? Well, this new expensive car I got, and I got this huge payment, maybe that wasn't a need that you had. Maybe God's going to let that one go back to the lot. Okay? But you have to understand, if you have a need, God will provide. Okay? God will provide for that need. So... Our worry is irrelevant. It's, it's, it's wasted energy. It's dissipation, wasteful expenditure of energy. We don't need it, but we still do. So when God, in his mercy, he scatters Babel. Instead of destroying the earth again, he certainly was well within his rights to do because of rebellion. He did. He decided to scatter them amongst the earth so that they wouldn't be able to plot and scheme and be their own gods and do whatever it is that they were going to do. Because God also made a promise that he wasn't going to flood the earth ever again. That's the rainbow. Which I'm sure all you know. Right? You know that the rainbow is God's covenant with mankind not to flood the earth again. So when you see it rain and the sun comes out, it's God saying again, 
See? I told you I was going to flood the earth. All right? Religion versus relationship. This is very important to understand. This was religion. It was purest form. Okay? Tower of Babel. This is what they were doing. They were trying to access God by their own power, by their own flesh, by their own ability. A relationship is dependent upon God to come to us. So I want to give you some contrasts here. Religion operates by man trying to ascend to God, trying to, to climb his way to God. Essentially, so he can bring God down to his own level. A relationship with Christ is based on God descending to man. That's exactly what Christ did, right? When he came down as a man, died on our behalf, so that we could be saved, so that we could have a relationship, enter into the presence of a holy God. So rather than us trying to work our way up, and what's easier? Think of in the natural what takes less effort. Trying to work your way up to God each and every day, shrouded in guilt that you haven't done enough. And that's what religion plays on. Plays on guilt, control. Okay? If you don't come to our church, you can't go to heaven. Right? <laughs> or if you don't come enough, you can't go to heaven. Guilt. It's not a relationship. A relationship says, you accept Christ and what he's done, God comes down to you. He sends his Holy Spirit, a helper, to work in your life. To do the things you can't do that he knows you can't do, which is everything. Christ said, without me, you can do nothing. Religion places faith in your work. All right? While relationship places faith in Christ's work. Right? Your religion is in your work. Have you done enough? I use my own experience in the Catholic Church. I, I, I tried to do a lot, but ooh, it seemed like everything I did, there was another thing that I missed. Right? It was, I was like juggling. Like, oh, well, I forgot to go to that. I forgot to do this. I forgot to do that. And I tried to do more and more and more. And all that brought was more condemnation, more guilt, more feeling that have I done enough? I never felt like I had. So I had to keep going back. It was that vicious cycle of religion where you feel like you haven't done enough. So you have to get back and do more. And, but you never can get to that point that you felt that you'd done enough. And there was no salvation in it. There was no deliverance in that. I knew it. My life bared it out. My life was still a mess. I, I, had no, I had no hope that things were going to get better. I had no hope. If anything, my hope was starting to fade. It was starting to dissipate in the fact that I would be able to be a good husband, be a good father. I, I had a feeling I just wasn't going to live much longer, whether it was the drugs, the alcohol, foolish decisions, whatever it was. Something, I, I really felt the darkness lurking around the corner. I did. I felt it. I knew it was right there. I knew I was one step away from getting sucked over the edge. I felt it at all times. Anytime. You know, people would say, oh, come out, just have a drink. Here's a good phrase for you to remember. Nobody starts as a drunk. They start with a drink. Right? Nobody starts saying, I want to be a drunk. Okay? And if you've never met somebody who's hopelessly addicted or hopelessly strung out, you know what it is to be in that. that it, they're almost, it is almost like they don't have a soul. And, and I don't mean to say that in a cruel way, but there's so much that's gone from their humanity at that point. And it, it's extremely sad to see. And to think that that is the, the potential outcome and think that, that you can stave that off, which is the powers of darkness, you can stave that off in your own power. It's foolish. It's foolishness. So I, and I knew that. I sensed that. I didn't know it at the time that that's what it was. It was satanic. It was demonic. I just thought, oh, I have a problem. I'm, I have a sick, you know, whatever it is. You know, whatever the world wants to tell me to get the, the culpability or the blame off my plate. Well, you're not responsible for that. It's, it's not your fault. It's the way you were raised. Or it's, it's a sickness. Which is all shifting blame. From you, who should be responsible for your own actions. And you should be responsible. I'm not saying it's, it's maybe it's, it's not a, 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 it's a struggle. It's sin, right? In sin, we can't control in our own power. That's what the world is really seeing in it when they say it's sickness. You know, the world a lot of times is more right than they realize. They just don't understand why they're right. And it is. 
Sin is a sickness. It's a disease. It's stricken all of mankind in whatever way. You know, maybe you have a great job and maybe a, a big house, and, and the world doesn't see outwardly your sins or your struggles, but you know they're still there. Right? You know that there's still an issue. But religion doesn't address that. Religion can't address that. Religion can't cut to the heart. Religion is merely external. It's a shell. It comes, it goes. You pretty yourself up, you go out, you do the works, you do what you got to do, <coughs> and you stave off your conscience just long enough <coughs> until the next time that you can go and do something. And it's you're living on a diet of self-righteousness. That's all it is. And you're suppressing and pushing down your conscience as much as you possibly can so you don't have to deal with the reality that you're not right with God. Okay? And that's all religion can give you. And you just hope, just like an AA meeting, that you get to another one, right, before the craving really hits. And just another bondage. The world wants to swap your bondages. Hey, swap this bondage for a more socially acceptable bondage. Swap being an alcoholic for going to AA. So at least you know you're trying, right? And listen, I have a heart for people who want the right thing but are going about it the wrong way. I'm not trying to condemn people who are looking for freedom but are finding it the wrong way. That's why I preach this gospel. Because this is the way to get out of that, to be free. Not to say that you're going to be a perfect model of humanity the second you give your heart to Christ. But it's going to say you have a place to go when you struggle. That's what it is. It's not trying to show the world that we're free from struggles. It's trying to show them, oh no, we have struggles too, but we have a place to deal with them. We have Christ. We have the power of the living God in our lives, this Holy Spirit that works in us, that helps us, that will give us peace in a situation that most people can't handle. So religion places faith in your own work, your own ability, your own doing. Relationship places faith in Christ's work. Religion brings condemnation, while relationship brings salvation. Religion is the breeding ground, or a breeding ground, for self-righteousness. All it does is increase your self-righteousness. All it does is make you feel more like you have played a part in yourself being right. And your righteousness is as filthy rags, the Bible says. There's nothing that we can do out of a, a fallen heart that's going to please God. There's nothing. Because it's all done in sin. It's all done with the wrong motives. There's, there's always something corrupt about it. Even if you can't see it on its face, it's still coming from a wrong heart. Now, works are important. I always have to touch on this. Because, you know, when I start talking about works and saying works can't do that, works can't do this... People say, well, I do, good, I do some good things. Adam, what are you saying about those? Those things are bad. No, they're good. That's why they're called good works. But good works are a product of what's going on inside of you. Right? When you're saved, when the Lord's working in you, good things are going to happen. You're going to want to do good things. But don't think that the doing of those things earns you anything with God. It doesn't. You don't have a bank account stored up in heaven that you're going to be able to cash in. That's not why you're doing that. You're doing them because they're right. Because of what God called you to do. And, and really from a selfless heart. You go out and preach the gospel to somebody. Share the word. It's for their soul. Not for yours. They're the ones who are going to have the benefit. Not you. Right? You're just doing it because actually it's the most selfless thing you can do. And because the Lord has called us all to do it. But you should have that burden. You should have God's heart as a Christian to want to see others saved. All right. So how do we let God work? All right, if God doesn't work in our lives through religion, through, through our own doing of things, and now let's bring that down because, you know, talking to people who know the Lord. So I understand you're not a religion. Okay? But we can set up these own little pockets of our life that are very religion-esque. Okay? We can set up our own little rituals, our own little routines, our own little things that we go to, that over time, you may not see it right away, over time, we kind of need to do those things to feel right, right? Almost like you see a baseball player stepping over the foul line, right? They just don't feel right unless they do that, because, you know, it's bad luck or whatever. We get in, we all get into a little bit of that, 
I, I, I put myself on there. With, so we can turn church into uh, coming to church service into a ritual, into a routine. You're here to receive from God. So we don't take attendance here. All right? If you want to come to receive something from the Lord, and the only reason you receive it is because we preach this word. If we didn't preach this word, if this was entertainment now, we wouldn't get anything. So you get a smile on your face, and you'd go out, and you'd be fine for a few minutes, and then you would encounter a problem. And then you'd be like, uh-oh. Well, all that's, you know, nice singing and dancing. Now, I'm not saying you, that's not part of a church service, but <clears throat> I'm talking about the modern-day entertainment center churches that are out there. It, they, it's, there's no po potential to deal with your problems. What do those pastors say to people who are struggling with drugs and alcohol? What do they say to people who are on their deathbed? What do they say to people who want freedom from the bondages that are in their lives? Because Jesus just wants to make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. It's not the gospel. It's not. It's you are stricken with sin. And the only cure for sin is the blood of Christ. Amen. So, the difference here, and here's what I'm trying to get with we still set up things as Christians in our lives that our, our faith can shift, right? Our faith can shift to those things to try and make God work. I'll use the example I've used a hundred times. My reading of the Bible, okay? I, I preach the Bible, I feel like I should read the Bible a certain amount each night, each day, right? And we can do it with prayer, too. Oh, well, some preacher said he prays half hour a day. I, I feel like i got to pray half hour a day. So you get on your knees, you start praying, you start praying, you, you pray as much as you can, you check your watch, you're like, that must have been at least 20 minutes, and it's like three minutes, all right? So, listen, <laughs> pray without ceasing, okay? What does that mean? Pray, pray all the time. Do you have to have a, a certain time at night where you're in your prayer closet praying for a half hour? If you want to. If not, you don't have to. But you're constantly seeking God, trying to hear from God. And I would say prayer is, it, it's obviously not only about bringing your requests to God, but it's also about letting Him speak to you and guide you. God, I have this issue. Where should I go with it? Well, I didn't hear an answer from Him. Well, I'll, I'll keep asking there's nothing in the everything in the Bible points to the idea of persistent prayer, not repetitive, mindless. I'm just going to repeat these words and, and God's going to do something like the rosary, but actually saying, God, I, I have this need. I, I need guidance. I need direction. And sometimes He'll leave you in that place of continuing to seek Him to strengthen your faith. God doesn't. Sometimes the answer is wait. Yes, no, or wait. Okay. But he'll give you an answer. He'll give you guidance. He'll give you direction. Maybe he'll give it to you the second that you need it. So say you're going into a, a meeting or something, and Lord, I, I need. I don't know which way this is going to go. I don't know. Maybe he'll give, put those words in your mouth the second you need them, the hour to speak them, not a moment sooner. But he wants you to continually seek it. But here's my point. All right, going off on a tangent. You can put your faith in your praying, saying. Like you feel better when you've prayed at that half hour a day, and that is a, a good thing. But you, if you miss it, then you start to think, uh-oh, now God's not going to work in my life. Right now, God's not gonna work. I'm not going to get a lot of God today. I'm not going to get a lot of His Spirit today. We all do it. I mean, I know I'm sitting in front of, uh, standing in front of some people who do this. I do it. Everybody does it. All right? So whatever it is, okay, we all get to that point where we feel like we didn't do enough to earn God's grace that day. Or we did something wrong and we lost out on His grace. God, you, thank God for this, okay? When you do it now, we do it when you get home. That He doesn't reward you or punish you based off what you do. It's what, about what you believe. Because if it was, well, we do a lot more wrong than we do right, okay? So we, the, the balance would always be against us each and every day. So God rewards you based off what you believe. So that's what I'm getting at to here. Even as believers, we get to these points all right, where we find that in our lives, maybe there's things that have to go. Or there's things that we've been trusting in, that we're, we're using a good thing the wrong way, like the Bible. I was using the Bible in a way to try and strengthen my own flesh. To say, well, I, I have to read this much a day, and if I don't, God's not going to bless me. Well, that's saying that God rewards me based off what I do. And God doesn't do that. 
He rewards you based off what you believe. Okay. All right, so here's letting God work. Let's let God work in all our lives. Let's, you know, open up the floodgates of grace into our life. God will work in your life if you let him. Oh, that's an interesting scenario. Now, God's not even for, he doesn't force his way in. Just like he doesn't force you to be saved, he doesn't force himself to work in your life. He wants you to acknowledge who he is and what he's done. He wants you to acknowledge that his sacrifice on the cross was enough. Enough for everything you need. Well, what about everything you need? But what about everything you need? What about that? Don't we understand at times? Every single thing you need. Apply the cross to it. Because when Jesus came down to die, he came down to pay for all sin. Okay? The root of all of your problems is sin. If you dig down deep enough, there's, it's because of sin. And I'm not just talking about the, your own acts of sin. I'm also talking about the sin, the sin nature, right? What we were given at the fall, all right? That's where all problems come from. Just like everything we see in this world, you know, murderous terrorists, disease even. Oh, disease is a great one. It's not great, but listen, listen, you have to understand this. You are not, it's not like Job's friends, right? When Job got sick, they thought... Oh, Job, you did something wrong. You sinned to get sick. No. Sometimes that is the case. Sometimes you do something foolish and there will be a disease associated with that. Smoking, lung cancer, you know, correlated diseases to, to act. But not all disease is, is sin, meaning that you did something to get it. But it is all, it does all come from the fact that we are fallen, that we have a sin nature, right? That's when disease essentially entered the world. And God still, it doesn't matter, paid for all of that at the cross, no matter what it is. So it, it doesn't matter what the issue that you're facing is today. When you're facing issues, all of you will. God already paid for it. And you need to rest in that fact every day and not be worried about the next problem that's going to come down the line. Okay, I know what I just said is a tall order. All right? And I don't do it perfectly either. And then I'm not calling for you to fake doing it perfectly. I'm calling you to press on in that endeavor by faith every day. To press on each and every day, knowing that what Christ did is already enough. That you are, <clears throat> think of this, you're sitting pretty, so to speak. You're going to heaven. Everything you need is paid for on this earth. Everything that God allows to happen in your life is for your good. Even if it looks like a horrible thing, and you don't understand it, it's for your good. In the end, when the story, the last chapter is written, okay, when you're in heaven, it was for your good. <coughs> Excuse me. Everything was for your good. We can't see it at this point. And I'm not expecting you to understand it. It's not about, it's not about you understanding everything that God does, every move that he makes. That's actually trying to discredit the, the role of faith in your life. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. There's a lot of things God's going to do that you're not going to fully understand. But you have to believe the promises that are in His Word. That it's for your good. No matter what, it's for your good. Well, this, is, this hurts. This is terrible. I get it. But it's for your good. Continue to believe. Sit, I mean, don't think you're a lazy Christian because you're sitting back and letting God work. That's how all Christians should be. I'm not saying you won't do things for the Lord, but that constant, I guess, tinkering of trying to make yourself better, 40 days of this, 21 days of that. Listen, I, I can respect the fact that you want to do the right thing, but you're going about it the wrong way. All right? It's a rest. Think of yourself sitting back with your feet up, letting God work in your life, and resting in that, because that says he's able, right? When you're sitting there working and working and working, you're saying God's not able. God won't do what he says he will do in my life. So he'll work if you let him. If you essentially take your hands off the wheel, he'll steer. He'll do it all. But it, it takes that, that faith in order to take it off and, and know that you're not going to crash. Or know that things aren't going to just you know, go to a huge mess in your life. So faith in his plan, just like Noah... Remember Noah? Noah didn't see the flood. Noah didn't know what he was doing. He was just building a big gopher wood ark and loading animals into it. 
You want to talk about in the natural something that people could have said was foolish? All right? But then what happened? He, he went from looking like the most foolish guy on earth to the smartest in a couple of raindrops. All right? So faith, just like Noah had, shows God that you acknowledge your own helplessness. Right? He was building that ark because he needed it. He wasn't going to be able to swim in that flood. He wasn't going to be able to survive that flood without God's provision. God's plan. Remember, the ark's a type of Christ. We're not going to be able to survive this without Christ. Eternal. God, through his grace, responds. Right, so you acknowledge your own helplessness by faith. I can't save myself. I can't make myself righteous. I'm no better than anybody else out here in my own power. Anybody. Even the wickedest one out there. I'm no better than them in my own power. Okay? I can't do it. Because of my sin. But you can and when you acknowledge him by faith and what he's done at the cross, God sends his grace. He responds by sending his Holy Spirit. Grace is unmerited favor. Remember, it's unmerited. You didn't earn it. You sat back and you asked God for help. That's not earning it. If anything, that's saying, God, there's nothing I can do to earn this. So he responds by sending his Holy Spirit to help you. Remember, he won't leave you comfortless. When you say, I can't do it, he'll help you. When you say, I can do it, he won't help you. That's it. It's that simple. If you walk around thinking that you can do it every day, he won't help you. Because you can do it, right? Like my son. Sometimes you let him fail. Sometimes you have to let kids fail. To show them. All right, well, you, you don't want, Daddy wants to show you how to do it, but if, if you think you've got it, I can do it. I can do it. Right? Go ahead. Go ahead. You let him fail. Let him fail. I understand. Right? And maybe they can ask for help. And maybe they can learn from somebody else. And that's us. There's so much in a child that we can apply to us. And our simple faith. Right? And our own inability. So this conforms you. This process is what conforms you into who God wants you to be. Which is more like Christ. And that's what this whole process is about. That pressing on to the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. If you fake perfection, well, you already got it. God doesn't need to work again. You already got your own little fake, perfect uh, persona and mask that you put on. And that's fine. You're good. God's going to move on to someone who can't do that in their own power, who admits their brokenness, but who looks to God, who said that he would help. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you that you sent him to comfort us, to help us in all we need. Lord, let us not go forth in our own power and our own doing. Let us look to you to work in our lives, to make us who we ought to be, Lord. Let us not take our eyes off the fact that sin still is our problem, Lord, and our, our uh, progressive sanctification or, or conforming into your image is what you want from us. So, Lord, allow us to go forth and allow that process to continue in our lives. Allow us to rely solely on you, Lord, and not turn to our flesh, not turn to the ways of man, and not turn to the ways of religion to try and be righteous. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you all.